welcome to Mr. Saucedo's YouTube videos. Today we're going to be looking at Zumdahl, the seventh edition, chapter 15, acid base equilibria. So the common ion effect is the very first section that we're going to be looking at here. And the common ion effect is really just an application of Le Chatelier's principle. So just to remind you, Le Chatelier's principle says that if we have a reaction that's in equilibrium and I decide to apply a stress to that particular reaction that's in equilibrium, um, the reaction will naturally and automatically shift in a way to lessen the stress. And so the common ion effect is exactly what it sounds like. It's what happens when there is a common ion um, between something that you are adding as a stress to a reaction that's already in equilibria. And so, for example, here I have acetic acid, water, and then I have hydronium ions, and I have an acetate ion here. Let's say I decide to add extra acid to this. So if I add more acid to this, what that's actually going to do is shift the equilibrium to manufacture more acetic acid. And so it seems like an odd thing, but because we have an ion that is in common, that's going to automatically move towards this direction instead. Another good example of that, HCN, water, hydronium ion, and cyanide. Let's say I decide to add a pinch of sodium cyanide to this. If I add a pinch of sodium cyanide, uh, cyanide being the common ion in this situation, that would be as if this was increasing in amount. So if this is increasing in amount, that means that I'm actually going to have my equilibrium shift the opposite direction. And so it's going to try to remove some of that cyanide that I added. And so in reality, it's kind of an interesting application, right? Um, because hydronium ions are on the same side as the cyanide ion is, if our equilibrium is shifting the opposite direction, that means that by adding a pinch of sodium cyanide, I would actually be pulling hydronium ions out of my solution. So in reality, HCN, you know, by itself is going to have a higher acidity um, than if I added just a tiny little pinch of sodium cyanide to that acidic solution because it's going to just move the equilibrium against this direction. So it's going to move it to the left. Now, let's talk a little bit about buffers. So a buffered solution is a solution that resists change in pH. The AP exam loves buffers and loves buffered solutions. Um, they tend to be weak acids or weak bases, and they have to contain common ions. And so it's kind of like an application of the common ion effect. Um, keep in mind, right, that after you add something like a strong acid or a strong base to a solution that is buffered, um, in reality, what happens is you want to always deal with the stoichiometry of the reaction first and then deal with the equilibrium part of it. And so we're going to do a lot of examples of that in the next couple of sections. So here's a good example of kind of how this works. So right here I have, um, well, quite a few common ions, but I've got dihydrogen phosphate and then I have hydrogen phosphate. If I add some acid to the solution, so I'm adding some H+, you can see that like all that happens is this hydrogen phosphate becomes dihydrogen phosphate. And so in reality, I am kind of keeping, I'm, I'm kind of removing the acid and making a different ion in response. And so that's kind of how buffers work. They either take acid or take hydroxide, right? So what we traditionally think of as like a strong base. And then it kind of just makes a different ion that's going to have a very solid pH as opposed to a very dramatic one like hydronium would or like hydroxide would. And so, again, this is kind of how it works. You have your original buffered pH solution, and whenever you add something to it like hydroxide or hydronium, it's going to modify the pH. Now, the steps for us solving this are to do some stoichiometry first to figure out what the new concentrations are and then to look at the equilibrium. And so buffering really is as simple as this. <laughs> you know, instead of when you add OH- minus to something, it kind of absorbs the OH- minus and replaces it with a conjugate base. And that conjugate base is going to have a very different um, Ka value, right, than 
hydroxide would. And so the final pH is going to be very close to the original buffer as opposed to the strong base that you added to it. And so the nice thing about a buffered solution is that there is a wonderful equation called the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, and it gives us kind of a relationship between um, uh, what you are manufacturing in your equilibrium, and also it gives you a nice look at kind of what the buffer is doing um, and at what point your buffer starts to break down. So the way that the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation works is it's like this. The pH is equal to the pKa, and remember, the Ka is just the equilibrium constant, right? The acidic uh, equilibrium constant for whatever we're looking at. And so the pKa is exactly what it sounds like, right? So if the pH is the negative logarithm, uh, the pKa is the negative logarithm of the Ka. And then all you do is you add the log of the concentration of A minus in your reaction to the HA of your acid. Now this also applies to bases too. We could very easily replace this with KB, and then again we would just have to swap around our you know conjugate um, our, our conjugates here. Now for a particular buffering system, like it says, right, all solutions are that have the same ratio of this to this will have the same pH. So it's kind of nice to know that there is a connection between kind of all buffers. Now, a good example of kind of using this would be, what is the pH of a buffer solution that is 0.45 molar acetic acid and 0.85 molar sodium acetate? So notice, right, that it's kind of giving us, okay, acetic acid, that's our HA. You can even see, right, this would be like the A, so HA. And then sodium acetate, well, the common ion here is that there's acetate, and that would be our conjugate base in our reaction. So if we know the Ka for acetic acid, 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5, all that we need to do is plug it into the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So the negative log of the Ka plus the log of, and in this case, that's our A minus, right? That's our conjugate base. And this is our HA. This is our weak acid. So all I do is plug in the numbers, 1.8 times 10 to the negative 5, and then plug in my 0.85 for our acetate concentration, our 0.45 for our acetic acid concentration, and then plug them into my calculator and add them up, and I get the pH of 5.02. And that would be the pH of this buffer system. And so that's how you can find the pH of the buffer system when they give you the concentrations of these two items. Now keep in mind, right, that the way that a buffer solution works is like I just said. Um, there is a breaking point though, right? So eventually, um, if you add, you know, an excess of H plus or an excess of OH minus, it's going to break down your buffer solution. So it does not last forever. Now, what are some characteristics? Well, buffers contain relatively large concentrations of a weak acid and its corresponding conjugate base. So when you add your H plus, what happens is it's going to react and complete its reaction with the weak base portion of your buffer. And then obviously when you add OH minus, it's going to react to completion with the weak acid. So because you have both of them in solution at once, you basically have basically you basically have a um, kind of a way of switching between, hey, what if something is acidic or what if something is basic? Well, you have something that can react with it in your solution already. Okay, so that's kind of just the general uh, characteristic of a good buffer solution. Now, I, I don't really think I need to read this entire block of text, but it doesn't have to necessarily be something, like I said, um, that is a conjugate, um, a conjugate base and a weak acid. It could very easily also be a base and it's conjugate acid. So again, we could switch. It's just the most common buffers that you're probably going to see are probably you know, weak acid and conjugate base, not necessarily base and conjugate acid, but they work the exact same way. Um, and the idea is that uh, the pH doesn't change very much. Uh, and there are several, you know, dozens of different buffer solutions that are useful in reality, like, you know, your blood is a buffer solution. The ocean is a buffer solution. Um, and so we can kind of uh, think of buffer solutions as being universal. They're really, they really are everywhere. Now, like I said, there is a breaking point. So the buffering capacity is kind of how much will it absorb before it starts to actually change the pH significantly. And so like 
any you know good chemical reaction there needs to be like a, a point where um, we now have exceeded right now we have too much of something and so the amount of protons or hydroxide ions that the buffer can absorb um, without a significant change in pH is the buffer capacity of your buffer solution that you're making. And it's really determined by the magnitude of HA and A minus that you have, or again, it could be the base and the conjugate acid. Okay, so again, every time I say HA and A minus, just realize that we could replace that with base and then conjugate acid instead. Now, a buffer with a very large capacity um, to kind of concentrate this means that you have like a very large uh, buffering capacity. And so in biology, that's super important. And so even though you don't know probably what any of these abbreviations are, these are some of the most common buffer solutions that you can make in biology. And they're ranked here from like, you know, a pH of about like five all the way to like a pH of about 12. And so depending on what sort of reactions you're doing, if you want to make sure that the pH is consistent, these are some choices. Optimal buffering occurs, though, obviously, when HA is equal to A minus. Now, it does change with your when your ratio changes of A minus and HA, um, but keep in mind that the optimal buffering amount is when HA is equal to A minus. And what does that do to the Henderson-Hasselbach equation? Well, think about it. If these are the same number, that's the log of 1, right? And so that means that this would be 0. So that entire term would become 0. And so that's when the pH is equal to the pKa. And that only occurs when HA and A minus, or, you know, again, this could be, again, a base and conjugate acid. Um, when those are equal to each other, that's when the pH is equal to the pKa. So choose a buffer. How do you know? Like what kind of buffer to choose? So the pKa of the weak acid is normally used to decide what sort of buffer you might want to pick. And so you want to choose a buffer who has a pKa, um, or sorry, a weak acid that has a pKa that's close to whatever you want your pH of the solution to stay around. And there are plenty to choose from. And so this is not an exhaustive list. In fact, I cut off, you know, a whole bunch of it. But you can see here, right, that like lactic acid has a pKa of 3.08, citric acid 3.13. So if you were doing a reaction around, you know, a pH of 3 or so, those would both be very common weak acids that you could pick. And then you could find, you know, the citrate ion or something. And that would be what you would use in order to make your buffer solution. Now, before we go on to anything else, um, the big application of buffers is in titrations. And so I figured that it would be useful to go through some very common titration terms before we actually go into the math of doing a titration. So if you've never seen a titration before, uh, this is kind of how it looks when you set one up. So you have an iron ring stand and a burette clamp. This thing here is a burette. That little thing right here that you twist is called a stopcock. And what you do is you kind of like, well, in this case, it's angled so that it's dripping in. Uh, but you could also turn it completely and it would give you a single drop. Or you can angle it, you know, a little bit higher up here and you would get a steady stream pouring down. So burettes are meant to be read from the top down like this. And so there is an initial reading that you would make. And so generally speaking, let's say, um, a burette might read up to 100 milliliters or something like that, or 50. And so what you would do is you would fill up your burette with a titrant. And a titrant is what you know um, the concentration to be, right? So if this is, you know, sodium hydroxide, you would know exactly what the concentration of sodium hydroxide that you're putting in your burette is. Or it could be hydrochloric acid, right? You want to pick either a really strong acid or a really strong base um, as your titrant because you know they're going to dissociate completely and that means they're going to be reacting with whatever sort of stuff you put in the bottom of this Erlenmeyer flask. And so like it says though, titrant, known concentration, that's super important. You need to know what your titrant's concentration is. Erlenmeyer flask, what do you have in there? Well, you have your analyte, which is what you are analyzing, right? Analyte, analyzing, kind of makes sense. And so that would be either a strong acid, a weak acid, a weak base, or, uh, or a weak acid. Wow, I, there are only four to choose from. Uh, 
And I felt like I may have said one twice. Um, but uh, the nice thing is, right, if you're like, well, how am I supposed to know what to do? Well, you could always check the pH of this, right, with pH paper or something. And so if it's a weak acid, you would use a strong base as your titrant. Uh, if it was a strong acid, you would use, you know, a strong base as your titrant. If this were a uh, either a, um, a base or... Um, uh, uh, sorry, a strong base or a weak base, you would use a strong acid as your titrant of a known concentration. Uh, normally, we add an indicator. An indicator changes color when there is a dramatic change in pH. Um, it lets us know whether or not uh, we are close to what is called the end point um, of the reaction. Generally speaking, I like to just say End point and equivalence point are basically the same thing, um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means later on. But for now, just know this is how you set up a titration, okay? In general, what it's going to look like when you do so. Now, titration curves. What is the point of titrating something? Um, well, to figure out what an unknown analyte's concentration is, that's like the big one. Um, but the nice thing is that you can plot the pH as you add titrant to your analyte, and you can actually graph it and get a function uh, that looks pretty interesting and pretty cool. Now, I used the term equivalence point and endpoint on the previous slide. What is the equivalence point? The equivalence point is the point in a titration when you've added enough titrant to your analyte that your uh, analyte has completely um, been uh, reacted with. And it's it happens at a stoichiometric point. You have to do a little stoic um, in order to, and it's very simple stoichiometry, by the way, uh, in order to figure out how much you need to add in order for it to react. Okay, so the equivalence point is actually something that's not hard to find, but when you're actually doing a titration for real, uh, it's very stressful because the closer you get to the equivalence point, um, the, let's say, more dramatic the indicator becomes. And as a result of that, um, it can be really scary because all it takes is like adding one extra drop of your titrant and you might totally have overshot your equivalence point and ruined your reaction. Sorry, I'm having like horrible flashbacks. So. The pH curve for a titration of 50 milliliters of 0.2 molar nitric acid with 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide. What would that titration curve look like? I told you they look cool. This is what it looks like. Um, and so what you have here, and if you know any calculus, uh, this is like our inflection point. And so what we have here is the volume of titrant that I'm adding. And you can see what we have here is a strong acid as our analyte. Our starting pH is really low. And that would be at zero, you know, zero titrant added. So we measured the pH before we even started. And then we start adding strong base. Notice it happens very, very, very slowly. Why? Because this area here, before we get to the equivalence point, is what we like to call the buffer region. So this entire area here is kind of acting like that Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. It's all buffered. And once we get to the equivalence point, everything breaks down. But again, notice that we started with a strong acid here because the pH is near zero, okay? And it's starting to increase as we go this way. Now, the equivalence point is seven, okay? This is only true when you're mixing a strong acid with a strong base. A lot of times people just assume that 7 is the equivalence point for every reaction that you're ever going to see in an acid-base titration, but that's just not true. 7 is only the equivalence point when you're mixing a strong acid and a strong base. Why? Because what do we know when we mix a strong acid and a strong base together? We get a neutral salt and we get water. So in this case, we're making sodium nitrate and water. Okay, what about the opposite? What if we're doing the opposite titration? So we have 100 milliliters of a 0.5 molar NaOH solution, and we're titrating it with one molar hydrochloric acid. So notice here, again, 
we have a strong base, though, that we're starting with, a strong base analyte, and we're adding a strong acid. We're adding HCl. So I can tell this because the pH is starting near 14. So because we're starting near 14, it's becoming more and more acidic, and so it's decreasing as we go down this way. And so just like before, this entire area before we get to the equivalence point is called the buffer region. And so that's where we would be using the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation to figure out what's going on. And the equivalence point is where everything breaks down because we have an equal amount, uh, well, an equal amount. That's because we have totally reacted our acid and our base at that point. Again, the equivalence point is 7, but it's only 7 because they're both strong. We have a strong base and a strong acid. I'll tell you this, 99% of the time on the AP exam, they're not giving you strong acid and strong base titrations. They're almost always giving you one of those being a weak analyte, right? So either a weak base that you're going to be, that's going to be your analyte, or a weak acid that's going to be your analyte. And so now we can finally talk about the weak acid strong base titration, which is the most common. Again, remember this totally works with a weak base strong acid titration. All you got to do is just kind of make your Henderson Hasselbalch equation basic. So use, you know, pKb instead, etc. And so step one of any weak acid strong base titration or any titration question is the first part of it is a stoichiometry problem. So you want to treat it like a stoichiometry question and determine the concentration of acid remaining in conjugate based form or in, and conjugate base that has formed in your reaction. Once you've done that, then you can treat the rest of it like an equilibrium problem and figure out where we are in our weak acid or weak base equilibrium in order to calculate the pH. So step one is always stoic. Step two is always equilibrium. Okay, now this, <laughs> this is already getting into a really long video. So um, I'm probably going to cut it here because we're immediately going to start talking about the math of titrations, and that is going to take a while. <laughs> there are still like 30 slides or something, or 20 slides, uh, where we'll be going over a lot of math, and so I will cut it here. And if you, uh, as usual, if you have any questions, please leave a comment. I'll try my best to respond. Um, and thank you so much. Mm -hmm.